This is the ERP Advisor. Today's episode, how to choose the top food and beverage ERP system. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, how to choose the top food and beverage ERP system. Sean Wendell is our speaker for today. Sean is the founder and managing principal of ERP Advisors Group based in Denver, Colorado. Sean has over 20 years of experience in the enterprise software industry, helping hundreds of clients across many industries with selecting and implementing a wide variety of enterprise solutions. His podcast, The ERP Advisor, has dozens of episodes with thousands of downloads and is featured on prominent podcast platforms such as Apple and Spotify. On today's call, Sean will discuss the ins and outs of food and beverage ERPs to guide decision makers through the disruptive process of upgrading their business with the right ERP. Welcome, Sean. Thanks so much for joining me today. Yes. Oh, Sean, are you, I think you might be on mute. Just kidding. <laughs> no. Good to see you. Thanks for having me as always. Yes, as always. My gosh. Okay, so the food and beverage industry can be quite complex. I mean, honestly, from operations and production to customers purchasing products to simply going out to eat at a restaurant. And um, food and beverage businesses are always trying to look for ways to improve their processes from production efficiency to their bottom line. Um, so with that, Sean, I'm going to ask you, um, firstly, if high level, um, if you can share with those joining us today, um, the ins and outs of food and beverage ERPs and what the basics that these ERP systems typically cover for this industry. Sure. Yeah. I, I think a, a good place to start, like you said, the challenges are just quite large, um, for this particular industry. Um, you're kind of in the bottom right of my screen, but I should look up. So I'm going to see if I can move you up some. Oh, I just moved you up. Great. Hey, there you are. Good. All right. Um, so, so if you think about the food and beverage industry, right, we can start with just food and beverage, right? There's very similar requirements for food companies and similar requirements for beverage companies, but there's some differences there too, right? And then you go down one more level and, oh, it's a food company. Well, what kind of food company? If you think about it, there's, there's a whole value chain of organizations that do a whole bunch of different things. And, and this is the secret to the whole thing here. I'm going to give it away in the first four minutes. Um, who are you as an organization? And I know this is going to sound very familiar to you in terms of, well, what are your needs? Right. But if you think about it, you may have an ingredients company on my far left, right? And if we did a little uh, diagram um, and we would show that there's companies that make ingredients that go into food products. Now, sometimes those companies also make food grade ingredients that go into other products. Interestingly enough, right. it might be a flavor that goes into or a, a fragrance that goes into a uh, construction product, for instance. So, so the ingredients companies are making, usually it almost looks like chemicals manufacturing more than anything, right? Or they right, make right. coatings and that kind of thing. Then you might go to say an organization that's sort of like a baker where they're putting together multiple raw ingredients to have sort of a product, right? Or could be a beverage company that's mixing ingredients to have a beverage. It could be a food company that's a dessert company. Um, interestingly enough, at that point, you can also see what about a firm or company that sells tomatoes or produce, right? right. That's a raw ingredient. And that has a whole life cycle of, of it's an inventory controls that is really complex. Like how do you manage a tomato? How much inventory is a tomato? Oh, we have five tomatoes or 5 million. No, no, no. No, what's the state of the tomato? Is it in, there's probably 20 different states if you think about the life cycle of a tomato and organizations that are in that uh, business, they have to track exactly what state the inventory is in. So, so then let's continue with say like a, like a baker. Um, now the baker has a finished product, right? Um, it may also then, let me actually kind of take one more deviation too, right? There are also meat companies. So say beef companies, there's also seafood companies. 
There's also whatever kinds of products. When you think about food, if you think about what's on your, your dinner table at night or at the restaurant, there's all kinds of things that could be there. So, so you sort of have to say, okay, what, what is this like kind of basically like, is it sort of like we take ingredients or we make ingredients and we mix them, we make a batch, right? And then we have a product that then needs to get packaged and then sold to maybe a distributor who then may repackage your packaging and then sells it to a, say a retailer, like a grocery store, and then sells that to a consumer. You know, the value chain looks like that versus a produce company, if they grow lettuce, let's say. The lettuce may end up if, um, and finally into, again, a bag that a, a consumer buys, or it might be a product that a business buys. And it may go through a couple different distributors between the time it goes from the farm to the table. So that's a lot of confusion and a lot of, of value chains that I just sort of you know, kind of mix together, but you have to sort of separate those out and sort of look at each stage to see where are your business process issues for real and what, what can software solve? You know, can, can software solve um, climate issues? No, it can't. <laughs> Although we are seeing some software vendors start to take more responsibility for that. Because if you think about the data centers around the world, right. they suck up a lot of juice, right? So what are they doing? That's a different story for another call, maybe. Another later. call. Yeah. But the bottom line is you really, as a food and beverage company, when you start looking at ERP, you really got to be specific about what are we really trying to solve with ERP? But that's no different than anything we've talked about. Right. A needs analysis is the first thing you have to do, right? To find out what your business is all about. And I mean, otherwise, I mean, how do you know which ERP to pick? Because there's a million, as we know, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So with that, um, is there more of a generic ERP that fits this industry or are there more industry specific um, type software platforms for each business? Um, is there a one size fits all? Oh, um, definitely not. And, and the way I would look at the market, um, Rebecca, this might be a good blog as I see her picture there, yeah. um, is, is probably from kind of a, a fourfold perspective. You know, one is let's say that a food and beverage company is having a really hard time with managing its expenses. Um, a procure to pay solution may work for them. If it's procure to pay, we can use any procure to pay solution. It doesn't have to be specific to food and beverage. Or if it's, wow, it's taking us forever to close the books. Okay, well, maybe an accounting solution, a financial reporting and analysis, or a month end close solution would work. That's all industry independent. It's not dependent on the food and beverage industry. So that's the first thing you have to start to take a look at, right? But then the second thing you have to look at is your company size. So let's say um, uh, one of our clients that we're working with recently, let's say they're 100 million in revenue approximately, and they have plans to go about, you know, 15, 20% growth each year. It's quite a bit. So in five years, double maybe even go bigger, maybe there's some acquisitions, whatever it is, um, that mid-size organization, there's mid-size ERP solutions for food and bev. And those are, those are good solutions that are in the market. They have very specific functionality for sure. And they're specific to food and beverage companies, mid-size food and beverage companies. Um, and along with that same sort of second dimension of sizes, they might be a lot larger, right? They might be a half a billion or a billion dollar company on their way to even more growth, at which point you have to look at a tier one solution, like a manufacturing solution that focuses on food and beverage, if it is more of a producer, um, you know, even a distributor model. And that's where SAP and some of the other bigger ones come in with those industry specific solutions and even some um, implementation partners focus in that area. So size is definitely the, the second criteria. I'd say the third one is, again, what are the processes that we're looking to automate in the software? So if we're really looking at warehouse management for perishable products with lot control and traceability that we have to have, well, there's mm -hmm. big solutions for that versus, say, a, again, a produce company that's looking at just inventory control like out in the field and being able to see exactly what the status is of product and what the available promise or readiness is. So there's, there's those um, business process issues that we have to look at. And then I would say the fourth thing that often gets lost, right, is 
what's the platform that we want for the long-term strategy of the organization? Because, um, yes, every food and beverage company we've worked with, I have to really think about this, mm -hmm. um, from cattle, shrimp, uh, bakery, uh, to ingredients, to some produce, some others, except for one of those was coming off a custom system. Oh, interesting. It's really interesting. Unlike other verticals or industries that we work with that are coming off of a, maybe an old Sage product or mass 200 or 500 or an old SAP or you know Oracle e-business suite or whatever, in the food and beverage industry, typically the legacy companies that have been around for a while, they're coming off of old legacy platforms, like usually custom written AS400. And that's across the board. Oh, wow. Literally every single one of them, one of them was written on a Unix platform, um, which is a little more um, newer, sure, than a than a AS400. Not to say that those platforms aren't bad. I don't want any complaints about that. There's, there's benefits to all of them. But the bottom line is, is that I think traditionally food and bath companies have had pretty complex requirements. And so the owner's brother's uncle wrote a solution and voila, that's what they grew the business on. Right. But now they're growing, they're getting bigger. They're seeing a lot more advertisings from companies, from ERP food and beverage companies. They're like, hey, this might work for us. And it will, that the solutions in the market today can meet the requirements that those legacy apps were, were written for in the past. Plus, then you get a lot more um, of the, you know, cloud base, if you want cloud, remote capabilities with mobility, you know, more secure kind of solutions, better reporting and analytics. So a lot of these firms coming off of these old platforms just benefit from coming onto a newer platform, not to mention the your brother's uncle's cousin who wrote it is maybe getting a little bit up there in age and thinking about, you know, retiring and not having to deal with all your issues and your systems every day. So anyway, those are just a couple of things too I throw out. So um, considering that, um, that there are so many moving parts and no business, no two businesses are the same. If they move from these custom platforms and go to a newer, more cloud type pro, uh, platform, are they able to get that same type of customization that they need, that they currently have? Hmm. Great question. And the answer usually is no. So we're in a client huh. right now. And when they want a very custom report, they call up Mr. Custom Report Guy, who's on the payroll for you know a fixed fee of a lot of money. Um, and uh, he writes a report because that's his job. His job is to build out those customizations. So it's, it's interesting um, that we would kind of go in this direction with this food and bed, because again, I think that the history in this industry has, has been that there haven't been very good solutions. So innovative um, companies in the food and beverage industry have said, whatever, I'm just going to go write my own, or I'm willing to take a product that's pretty close and maybe customize it, or I'm going to take something that is sort of process manufacturing based. Um, so it doesn't deal with discrete, it deals with recipes and yields and that kind of thing. And I'm just going to live with it and everything else, like my R and D and quality and, and lots and labels I'm going to get from some other system. So they get a hodgepodge of systems. So, so I do think, um, probably in the last, I mean, definitely 10 years, I think the food and beverage ERP market has come down market so that an organization that's you know, 10, 15 million in revenue and beyond can get a pretty fast ROI and switching to a food and beverage ERP. Whereas, you know, years before that, when we were, when I was at JD Edwards, we had a food and beverage solution, but I'm not totally sure that it was, you know, really that great because that particular product was written for more discrete manufacturing, right? So, yeah. Some of the discrete manufacturing solutions today, ERP solutions have written a process pack where they've written, hey, we can handle process manufacturing, but innately, it's sort of a different flow to it. So, so it's super interesting. Right. Well, um, considering um, an ERP system for a food and beverage, like how does it impact a certain business with them, their work that they do with customers and vendors? Is that something that they sh should consider when picking a, a new ERP system? Oh, God, yeah. I mean, of all of our industries, it's it's more important 
to understand um, then the vendor side, electronic data interchange. And I'm not talking EDI. I'm talking about like 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 a lot traceability, ingredient information that your supplier needs to pass to you. And there's industry specific solutions that can help with that for sure. So so let's say you're buying a specific syrup for a product that you mix in with some flour and some other things to come up with a scone, for instance. Well, the company that sells you the syrup, they have to give you all the ingredients they used in the syrup, and they have to give you the lots of the ingredients that they use specific for that batch that came to you. So that data has to come over. And again, there are some industry specific solutions that, that do that data share really, really well. But without that, let's say your scone gets sold to Costco and everybody buys the Costco scones and then they're gone like the next day. And you're like, Costco, you broke my heart again. Where's that product that I love? Why don't you have it anymore? We've all been there, right, Julia? I mean, right, we've right. all been there. Yeah, the, there's a specific cracker that we get that I just know there's going to be a day. Yes, you go be, and it's not going to be there anymore. It's not going to be there. So we always buy six boxes and Eric is like, don't buy all the crackers. And I'm like, oh my God, they're not going to be, you buy the toilet paper, I'll get the crackers. <laughs> it's a different time. We've that's all right. had to get desperate, haven't we? <laughs> that's right, that's right. Anyway, um, but that, so that vendor information about their raw ingredients, right? If you're a discrete manufacturer, maybe you need some serial numbers or you need some specifics for high-tech electronics manufacturing, but you don't need that level of information. You just don't. Um, so that's huge on the vendor side. And then you're on the customer side are the vendor to the customer who needs that exact information for you. So let's say you are a shrimp, even a distributor, or maybe you do some value added services over shrimp. You buy a bunch of shrimp, you cut it up a little bit, or you put you repackage it. Not only do you have to track the raw ingredients that you use, so there might be shrimp, there might be salt, some other chemicals that go into it, also need to track the packaging that you right. use and the lots of some kind of unique identifier on the packaging. You also have to track what machines you used. You also have to track the cleaning and the hygiene that was done on the machines that was appropriate. Sometimes you even have to track the employees and their skill set and certifications that worked on these things. That's right. So the most interesting thing to me about the food and bev industry um, is the barriers to entry are so high because who can afford to do all of this processing and capture of data and compliance and regulatory and everything else? So, I mean, that's why we see a lot of food companies. There's one in Colorado recently we talked with that basically uh, most of these kind of newer food types that come on the market, they'll use what's called a co-packer. So somebody else is responsible for taking the ingredients, tracking raw materials, safety information, doing the processing, putting together the final product, putting it into a package, and then you know sending it out. Um, and so those guys are the ones that have all the safety and regulatory requirements, whereas more of a marketing or branding company, or they come up with the ingredients or the uh, recipe companies, um, don't have that responsibility. But again, they're depending on these co-packers that if the co-packer screws up, they're, right. they're, they're dead. I mean, literally. So with that, let me ask you, um, does, do there, there are two different companies. Does their ERP ever overlap because they're working together on the same product, but they're two separate companies. Is that even yeah. possible? Well, if you think about it like this, like, um, like let's say it's, uh, especially in Colorado, we have a lot of companies that are like this, where somebody gets a great idea. Maybe they make something in their kitchen or a little bit more than that, a little more industrial. Um, and the product starts to get a lot of, of headway in the market and people want more of it. So they go to a co-packer, they give the co-packer the recipe, and then they set the specifications on what the product needs to be, as well as even the packaging. And the, the company, the, the, the food company may even buy all the raw ingredients. They might not. They might not buy the packaging. They may. It just it depends on the business deal. But basically, we're out, they're outsourcing that manufacturing and processing and, and safety data sheets and regulatory to another firm who maintains all that. Mm -hmm. So our systems, if we're, the, if we're creating the, the brand of the product, we may have an ingredient system, which would be in like a product lifecycle management system. We may even have a lab with people that kind of do a little bit of, of experimentation with products and that. And then they say, okay, this is the recipe. They send the recipe to the co-packer. 
And then the co-packer would do the manufacturing at that point. And there, that co-packer would track all the manufacturing information. And then when there's finished product, they send it back to us as the food company. So we have it and it's available, or we at least have access to their information. I mean, that's just one model. It could be right. the opposite. Right, right, right. You're the co-packer who has 50 companies that you make stuff for, right? And all 50 of them have different ingredient requirements and you got to keep all that straight. They have different recipes. We had one situation where we had a client that they had, um, they had one customer that they sold to, but that customer had five or six different co-packers and each of the co-packers had different recipe requirements for whatever okay. reasons. So wow. you know, th this is why, you know, there are solutions in the market. I think NetSuite's done this. I think N4 has done this where they have kind of food and bev specific functionality, which is pretty good. And they may rely on a third party solution for safety. Maybe they don't go that deep. Um, fine, right? But but when you start talking about these really, really complex scenarios, like you got to be sure that you're getting an application that can actually support it because it's, you're just not a food and bed solution. I don't care what anybody says, right? You got to go this level to say, what are your scenarios? What are you trying to automate? What data do you have to have? What systems do you need to integrate with? And, you know, the solutions that are available in the market just start to dwindle to just a couple that can actually do your requirements. Right. Well, um, with that, how can the right ERP um, uh, help manufacturers navigate the 21st century food and beverage market as it is today? Can you yeah. speak to us with that? Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, and it kind of goes back to what I said earlier, that a lot of the food and beverage companies coming out of um, you know, the, the, the 2000s, the 2010s were on legacy systems, which meant they were probably writing a lot of stuff down on paper somewhere. Every client we've been in, that's what we've seen. They've got, they've got, they are tracking the information. They wouldn't be in business if they didn't do that. Right. But the way they're tracking it is putting a lot of work on their people. And it's a little bit risky, but they've been okay. They're going to be okay, right? Or they wouldn't be in business today. So, so that's what I think the biggest opportunity with these ERPs are, is not only does the compliance and the safety do we feel better about it as owners at the end of the night, right? literally every night you can sleep better knowing that at least the information is being put in the system, but ultimately you've got people that are out there doing a lot of manual stuff. And, you know, you could sort of layer in this, this job market that there we're, we're in these days where it's tough to find good people and retain good people. Right. And so there's a little bit of a morale boost that some of these organizations get, especially on the food producer side where, mm -hmm. you know, people are doing manual stuff and see, they know, they know the risk, the individuals do. And I think, you know, specific to our clients and the firms we've worked with, we're pretty lucky. Our clients are like the best on the planet. I love them and do anything for them, honestly. And we do. Right. Yeah. They usually have great cultures and they are really, really empowering of their people. And they know that their people are really making it go right day in and day out with these tools. So when those people start to see what the automation can be, if it's done right, they love it. They're super happy, more productive. And we get them out of you know writing down, this is the lot number, right? To either doing barcode scanning or we're even doing some blockchain stuff with some customers where we're pulling data in and it's you know uniquely identified throughout the life cycle of the product where that basic stuff is done. And now you can get a compounder who's been really like barely like trying to put these recipes together correctly and making sure they get the right weights and the right ingredients and the, you know, kind of the right format, the right process to now they're starting to do things and thinking about things in a whole different way. The innovation can go up and sort of the morale can go up with that and the productivity can go up too right because i i think that's the last thing i would say on this question juliet full of yeah. all kinds of good information today okay. is I, I think the reason why we love working with food and beverage companies is because they are very innovative mm. they really have to be where they are okay. constantly looking at new products their customers are pushing them for new products their vendors are giving them new products and so you know they could be doing bread and doing bread for years and years. And then a customer says, you know, we love your bread. We love working with you guys. We want you guys to put together a muffin. Mm. We'll figure it out. R&D, start working on it. Get the lab out. Start putting together some muffin recipes. Put together some samples. Send it to the customer. Oh my gosh, one of our clients did that. Um, 
and uh, did very, 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 very well with uh, kind of an innovative product, a dessert product. Mm -hmm. uh, that was just fantastic. They were able to be very responsive. They had a pretty good ERP in place um, and, and they were able to like innovate. And, and that's what's cool is you see that the innovation can go up. Innovation can go up for many reasons, not just ERP. But right. once you go through the heartache and pain of moving recipes, moving all your compliance, getting your SDSs, all that stuff over, the, the safety data sheets, you, you can actually then start taking the business to a whole new level, which is super exciting. Right. You can have a tried and true product, but still be needing to be relevant and competitive in the market, right? Especially exactly. nowadays. Oh my God. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, all of our clients are in very competitive environments, but these food and bev companies like, you know, Joe Schmo puts together a whatever, new peanut butter, <laughs> whatever it is, or a new bread or a drink or whatever that pops up, you know, there's a new a kind cracker. Of new. <laughs> yes, it's crazy. So yes. yeah, new crackers, whatever it is, and it just whoop, can take the market so fast. So, so I do think, you know, it's really risky doing ERP anyway. We've talked about that to we're red in the face. Um, right. Um, and if food is especially, and beverages, is especially risky because of the regulatory side, for sure. And you have so much data that you have to move over the usual blah, blah, blah that we say about data migration. That's right. true. But getting that level of process automation that you can get from, again, a, a, a cloud-based ERP that's great and prevalent in the market, then layer in that process manufacturing, then layer in the food safety, the labeling, compliance, the R and D, the product lifecycle management, and it's like it's like a whole new game, and that's cool. That's that's where it starts to make a lot of sense. Yeah, well, these manufacturing type businesses um, are there specific features that they should um, consider with their new ERP system? Yeah, oh, w without a doubt, and and it's sort of. There's probably five areas I would say. There's there's definitely sort of demand planning and materials requirements planning, MRP, right? And depending on how sophisticated and big the company is that you'd split those out, maybe you can kind of mush them together. But you know, being able to plan with ingredients that go into your into your product as a producer can save you a ton of money on purchasing volume, um, you know, doing minimum order quantities, getting getting more sort of, of, of planning and scheduling and just being more proactive with your business, right? That's definitely the first part. For sure, the R&D side um, of putting together uh, different kinds of, of recipes and trying different things or sampling and all that, getting kind of through that, that product lifecycle management process is huge um, for sure. And there's lots of solutions on the market that do that, but where they fail is in the integration with the ERP. So that's the second thing I'd say is that PLM into like a manufacturing order. So sort of getting that process really whoop streamlined is a huge benefit. So R&D makes a change, um, uh, manufacturing gets it, they do it, vice versa. They can communicate back and say, hey, we're seeing this. Huge benefits there for sure. Definitely. The third one is kind of interesting because I think a lot of software salespeople, frankly, will sell manufacturing um, uh, kind of execution systems, MES, or shop floor management. Mm -hmm. And there are definite benefits there to integrating scales into your manufacturing order so that you're actually seeing the quantities that go into the order for sure. That's beneficial. But like tracking somebody's time, eh, it's not so beneficial. It's not. So there's a, there's a level of control on the shop floor that I think you want to put in for sure. But it's not like, wow, let's automate everything. There's some environments where it totally makes sense where all the people come in, okay, we're going to charge our time now to this um, process, right? Especially those that repack. Um, you know, we've got, we've got this size of a bag of lettuce and we need to, right now, that's how it comes into us. Or there's boxes. Now we need to put them in these bags. Now start, okay, everybody charge their time and, you know, let's do this now. And, okay, now we have actual time. Standard costs can help with that, but how do you do standard costs if you don't have the actual time captured somewhere sometimes? So manufacturing execution for sure, maybe just not to the depth of, hey, let's automate everything and have robots do this. That's not going to work. Right. So fine. QC unequivocally, absolutely positively having all the data come to QC, all the regulatory information from our, our manufacturers, being able to bring all that together to show what tests we did, 
all the steps that were done, all the certifications signed off, all in one place, hallelujah. Like literally that's a hallelujah step for sure. And then I would say kind of the fifth thing is, um, I actually have three more, but I'm trying to think of the most important. Um, but, but probably the fifth thing is around, I think the whole sort of customer vendor data flow with sort of, there are some EDI opportunities for sure, which is getting base transactions back and forth. Mm -hmm. Even if it's sending an advanced ship notice, once your carrier picks up the product, send that ASN over to Costco so they know. Costco, Walmart, Kroger, those guys are demanding that stuff already. So a lot of our clients are already doing that. But when you look at that, that ability to kind of look at the whole ecosystem or the, the value chain from customers and vendors and sharing that electronic data, with all those base transactions in, it does just get pretty exciting. There's just a lot more opportunities to kind of collaborate more closely with your partners. Yeah. So Sean, as a business grows, um, are there some warning signs that they should look at that would be an indicator that they need or should look for a new ERP system? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, the first one, again, just based off our experience is legacy developer getting old. Because not only is the business growing, but it's it's maturing over time. Right. So, um, you know, that's the first one for sure. Is you got to watch out for that. But but probably the second thing is the amount of volume is going up, and that's where we really see with clients like, okay, you could kind of get away with all the manual stuff when you were half the size. Now mm. you're you're you've got twice as much you're doing before. And, you know, your people are what's holding it together and the people are great, but we've got to get them some tools. So when volume starts to really increase and you'll know, you will know, you can go out and start talking to your best people and you say to them, hey, what keeps you up at night? Right. And you listen to what they say and they're probably going to say a lot of manual stuff. It's not it's not the well, I'm trying to come up with this new recipe or I'm trying to you know, figure out how to make things more better, whatever. No, it's like, uh, you know, we had this order, we had a, a customer complaint or we had to do, um, you know, we had to quarantine some things because of uh, somebody got sick or what, and we barely found the information for it. Oh, wow. Oh, but we wow. did, we did, but we barely did. I don't want that to happen again. Oh, right. Like as a, as, as a sponsor, somebody who's going to be interested in this ERP, like those are the things that you have to look out for. <laughs> And it's like, okay, I get it now. This is why we have to move to better systems. The systems solve everything, of course not, but they help you and they help you a lot more. And, and you're relying less on these key people for that kind of thing. That's probably the biggest indicator, I'd say. Right. So say a, a business, they um, decide they need a new software. They select one, they implement it. Um, what can you talk to um, what they can expose, expect both long and short term once they have a new system in place? Like how can yeah. it benefit them? Yeah, well, I think the benefits we've talked a lot about, but what I think is interesting, Juliet, is it's, at, we, we sort of call it the phase one syndrome. <laughs> There's a phase one implementation, meaning, you know, ERP fatigue, we've all heard that before. Like you gotta go through all this effort to, what do we need and what's the right solution and contracting and then implementing and data and oh, right? Everything goes live and now we got a system. That's the phase one. And that probably automates 20% of what's possible. Literally. Hmm. Wow. So, yeah. So over time, right, you've got a platform now that you can evolve. And frankly, some of our clients, that's all they ever do. And that's totally fine, right? Mm -hmm. But some of our more innovative clients, they're more interested in how do we get to that next level of advanced planning and scheduling, where we really can take advantage of the demand planning tools that we have and the MRP, and we can look at capacity planning and scheduling by different lines. Because a lot of these folks, some of some of the food processors do the same thing over and over, but many of them have different processes that they take the ingredients through that just the recipe calls for heating or cooling or evaporation or separation or all kinds of things I'm not even an expert in. Um, and, and so then how do we maximize the usage of not just our people, but also these assets and the ingredients, right? So that's kind of that next level. And then I think the ultimate level um, is really around even, um, you know, manufacturing automation, so using more robots, 
and tying that data even into the ERP so that we can see temperatures, how, how temperatures are increasing and decreasing based off of our recipes and what the yields are from that. So, so you can see how if you get more real-time information from production, build that in with inventory and vendor information. Do we have certain vendors who products we just, they don't do as well in our manufacturing process as others. I mean, there's key people running around that know that unequivocally. Mm -hmm. But to know that and start identifying that from, you know, it's kind of that artificial intelligence, yada, yada stuff. But it's kind of true because you have the base transactions. Now, we, if we, the more we machine sort of the floor, those machines kick out a ton of data. Uh, it's mm -hmm. called SCADA, I think. It's, uh, I can't remember what that stands for, but it's information that pops out of these manufacturing systems that can, that somebody's already maintaining. Right. But then we can sort of bring that together to make some really interesting decisions. So, and of course, there's information from our customers that we could bring into to make better decisions about what to make and um, more real-time visibility with vendors. We've been, I've been talking about that for 25 years, right. but, but you see how you get kind of these core, like safety is solved, lot traceability, right. no problem. We got a recall, we handled it, fine. We have, remember these guys get audited like nobody else too, by the way, right? They've got auditors that are coming in, especially if they do things like certified organic or kosher, hollow, right. whatever the different types are. So, you know, we got to meet all those re regulatory requirements. When you say regulatory, I mean real regulatory, right? right? Not just OSHA or whatever. Right, it's the FDA. FDA, like, yes. exactly. Yeah, so all those things, once those are solved, then you can get into some really cool things that um, are, are just really interesting from a whole new level of performance. Right. Well, Sean, we had a question come in here. Um, oh, one, SCADA is supervisory control and data acquisition. Perfect. Thank so you. Thank you for that. Yes. And so we had a question come in from someone um, joining us today. What do you think of NetSuite's food and beverage solution? We are implementing it for many different firms in this industry. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, this isn't the time where we get into specific apps, but I can right. answer the question a little bit. Um, <laughs> the, the bottom line is, I think it's a good solution for some companies. But I, you can say that for everybody. So I'm sort of punting a little bit. Um, again, the key thing is if a company understands their requirements in and out mm -hmm. and can look at the NetSuite solution where it's good and where it's not, right? NetSuite has many industries that, that it services. I think we've implemented all of them, by the way, mm -hmm. literally, including food and Bev on NetSuite for a couple of different clients that have done great. But they both required labeling and um, food safety systems that sat outside the apps. Now, again, mm -hmm. that's common, but can SAP meet some of those requirements maybe a little bit better? Yeah, but for a little bit higher implementation costs. So, you know, there's a trade-off, I think, in all the solutions. I think it's a great solution for sure. Mm -hmm. we've, we've had great success with some of our food and beverage clients for sure. Um, but there's other solutions in the market that maybe are a little more focused on just that industry. Um, and you should take a look at those also. Aptian comes to mind. Process Pro actually now is owned by Aptian. Batchmaster, which does some work with Acumatica. Um, there's other solutions out there as well. So, um, I mean, they're all, they're all good. And that's why they're at that level, right? There's a lot of other solutions. Um, interestingly, I think for a seafood distributor, we sort of did a whole, we cast the net <laughs> um, <laughs> or um, like all the seafood dist distribution ERPs in the market. They were like, 50 right. tons of them. Wow. Tons and tons and tons. You know, there was a guy who used to be a lobster fisherman out of Maine who wrote an app, right? Or there's, or I think even for that client, we went with NetSuite. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you really have to sort of look at the industry, understand the requirements again, look at the solutions that are in the marketplace, and then, and then certainly mm -hmm. find the right one. One of the benefits of a NetSuite, though, is that it is widely supported. You have partners that, you know, your partner, your implementation goes great, but then they go out of business or get bought. That's more like it. And you don't like the new owners, fine. You know, go to another NetSuite partner because that product is really well suited. So that's probably a big differentiator, I'd say. Right. Well, as we started with, um, that's where your needs analysis would come in to help you decide what you needed and help you select the platform that fits your needs, right? That's it. Right. So I think we're coming to the end of our time today, but um, is there, as we wrap up, can you leave us with a piece of advice um, for 
the food and beverage beverage industry and finding the right ERP to fit needs. Yeah, yeah, I think, like I said, um, I guess in my career, after doing this for a long time, I, I do see, unlike other industries, um, there have been solutions for this space for a long time, but, but I just think there's more of an uptake for food and bev companies of all kinds, like I described earlier, to actually look at new solutions now, whether it's the move to the cloud, the original developer being in a position where they're not able to support the app, or the customers asking that the, our, uh, these companies for more innovation, or the regulatory requirements are increasing, they're looking for software, they're looking for automation solutions for sure. So you really just, again, want to make really, really certain. I mean, again, you could say this for everybody, but especially in this industry that you really understand what's real in the solution and what's not, mm -hmm. and really understand what the vendor is going to provide and what isn't. And if they rely on third-party solutions, like a lot of the mid-tiers do, well, who's responsible for that integration? What happens if the other vendor changes something? Or what happens if the other vendor changes something, right? Who's going to maintain that? So don't just think this is like going out and buying a car, right? And you take it to the shop to get it fixed. Like these are complex solutions that you really need to think through because you may have, like I said earlier, a labeling solution. You may have a warehouse management solution. You may have a safety solution. You may have a separate purchasing or even just an ERP solution. That's one of our, our um, distributors. A food distributor has um, five different um, types of applications. I think they have a QC system that's specific oh, for wow. So you have to have an IT department that supports all those solutions. So of all of the rent, the uh, verticals or the industries that we work with, this one in particular, we love working with them, um, but you have to think through that long-term support of whatever solution you go out and buy in the market. Like what's this really gonna look like in five years? What are some of the challenges we can have? And that's totally fine. All of them have challenges. Just make sure you have the plans and resources in place to handle them. That's right. Sean, thank you as always for sharing um, so much great information. I appreciate yep. it. You're welcome. So, and thank you everyone for joining us for uh, today's webinar. Please let us know if you have any questions. We're happy to uh, answer any questions you have, happy to help in any way uh, we can. Be sure to join us for our next webinar scheduled for Thursday, May 12th best ERP strategies for natural resource companies. We will cover how natural resource companies can leverage their software solutions to satisfy requirements throughout the life cycle of their oil and gas, mining, solar, and other natural resource companies. Please go to our website, erpadvisorsgroup.com for more details and to register. ERP Advisors Group is one of the country's top independent enterprise software advisory firms. ERP Advisors Group advises mid to large size businesses on selecting and implementing business applications from enterprise resource planning, customer relationship management, human capital management, business intelligence, and other enterprise applications, which equates to millions of dollars in software deals each year across many industries. This has been the ERP Advisor. Thank you again for joining us. ERP Advisors Group is one of the country's top independent enterprise software consulting firms, advising mid to large sized businesses on selecting and implementing business applications, including ERP, CRM, HCM, business intelligence, and other enterprise applications, which equate to millions of dollars in software deals each year across many industries. This has been the ERP Advisor.